Hello, fellow believers at the Creek. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Your pastor asked me to bring the sermon today. And when he did so, he said, Russ, I want you to tell these people who you are and tell them how you and I are connected. So I'm going to honor that. My name is Russell DeWitt. This is me with a buddy. I'm the one with uh, the shaved head and wearing glasses. Lest you get confused, here's another shot of me with some friends at the gym. Again, I'm the one with the bald head. And here I am with Switch. We're close. Some fun facts about me. Number one, I leave the house at 5.30 a.m. and walk 23 minutes to work. Now, this is not because I'm into a healthy lifestyle. My car was totaled two months ago, and I scrapped it for metal. And this, I tell you, hoping someone hearing this will take compassion, pony up, and buy me a car. Number two, every third day of the week, I do Tattoos Day. An image is applied to a freshly shaved scalp and shared with the world. So here's a few examples. This head is great real estate. So if you want your logo advertised, the charge is only 12 bucks a day. Uh, fun fact number three, I have written some books and they're published. So I'm a smarty pants too. How are Cam and Russell connected? Here is the story. Ooh, wait. Here's a shot uh, showing a little bit of my domestic life. <laughs> They're feeding me, watch. Oh, nice. Need more. Oh, babe, do you see what more. she's doing? More? more. Ava, Joe. More. Ava, Joe. Say, show Russ, say please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell Russ, say. <laughs> Please. Okay, now the story of how Cam and Russell are connected. I was born in 1969 and raised in a suburb of Chicago known as Lombard, Illinois. This is me as a kid. I was seven years old when I realized I was a sinner and needed saving. To keep it short, that was when I called upon the Lord and asked him to save me. At some point, stuff happened, namely sin. There was drug abuse and violence in our home. By the time I was in the seventh grade, our family was altogether unchurched. This is me as a teen. One of my means of escape was gymnastics. Part of my other family was another brotherhood. Something irreplaceable happened among us. We worked crazy hard, and we excelled. In short, uh, in the 80s, International Gymnast Magazine ranked our team number three in the nation. I was the team's co-captain, too. And you know, all these years, my dad never saw me compete once. None. I never doubted his love for me. It's just that he did not mentor me. You see, if he was not working one of three jobs, he spent every remaining drop of time trying to keep his wife from utter self-destruction. You know, through all of this, much of this, I was still missing something. At age 15, I journaled. I wrote, Lord, I am your child, but far from living as though I am your child. Something tells me you want an all or nothing relationship. So what's up? This is my sister and brother-in-law's newlyweds. What I did not know at the time was my sister, at the same time I was journaling, she prayed God would bring another male role model into my life, a person that would mentor me. 
The next Sunday, I asked my dad to drive me to church. I attended a few services for several weeks, sitting in the back row by myself. Shortly, a new youth pastor was introduced to the church. Enter Cameron South. This gentleman reached out to me. Here's a shot of Cam, Cheryl, and little Lindsay. Uh, at the time, even Cam will tell you, he did not know what he was doing. He just invested his life into me. What he also did not know at the time is that what he was doing, he was being as the Apostle Paul was to those whom he mentored. Paul wrote, so being affectionately desirous of you, he's writing to the Thessalonians, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto the us. See, a real discipler will invest his life into other people. Through his discipleship to me, I reached out to my teammates. Hey, Cam Cheryl, here's you with Rex Roth. <laughs> Bob is the one on the left. He went on to Bible college. He met his awesome wife, Becky, and they serve the Lord together today. At any rate, uh, Cam South and I have been friends since I was 15 years old. So let's move on to the sermon. For lack of better words, I was at the top of my game in 2018. I was an independent contractor for an international company, earning a generous income and enjoying life. Being among the top 2% producers, I was asked to give keynote speeches for numerous company events. Sparing many details, one thing the Lord used to visit me was from the prophet Jeremiah. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. One morning while fetching I don't know what from my bedroom, I stopped in my tracks, stood at my dresser, placed my hands on top of it, and said something to God. God, I realize the state wherein my heart lies. I don't want you. Although I want your stuff, I really don't want you. As I pray right now, I confess I'm in a sinful place. This heart needs to change. You're the only one who can change it. I think I need to be broken, so... Whatever the cost, yes, whatever the cost, go ahead and break me. I ask for a heart that truly delights in you. Within 48 hours of praying, the company with whom I had a contract had its assets frozen and they were shut down. By the way, I was one week away from a $20,000 paycheck. My sole means of income was immediately halted. A friend of mine, Bob Rexroth, weeks later said, you prayed that and that happened to an entire company? Dude, you owe a lot of people an apology. It doesn't end there. I had tens of thousands of dollars invested in a venture, one that had nothing to do with any other business, for the purpose of an emergency fund, you know, for a rainy day. All of that was stolen. Let's review. I prayed the aforementioned prayer, including God, whatever it takes. And within 48 hours... I lost my high dollar contract and I lost every penny that was set aside for a rainy day. Coincidence? I think not! Since I originally planned on using an upcoming paycheck, the one that was frozen, to pay taxes, I ended up owing Uncle Sam a lot of money. 
I still owed on student debt for an MBA procured in my 40s. My wife, Sharon, was a full-time grandmother without pay for one of our grandkids. I started doing open mic nights at a comedy club in downtown Indy. Quickly learning the life of successful stand-up places one constantly on the road, I bailed and started serving at an Italian restaurant. As time passed, bills were coming in and we were falling behind. We almost had utilities cut off and our mortgage was facing foreclosure. Sharon managed to get a job. I bailed on the restaurant and started a job at a warehouse. Many times through this chapter, I was angry with God, telling him he was doing it wrong. Many conversations were had with your own pastor at the Creek Church. If you let me be raw with you, Cam endured many of my profanity-laced rants. On occasion, he'd be firm, but never without compassion and caring. The Lord provided. We never starved. Our utilities remained on, and we got to keep our home. My student debt is paid, and, God willing, our tax debt is settled in just a few months. I'm still employed at the same warehouse. Although I am the same Russell, my heart is different than it was five years ago. Still tainted with the sin nature, my being is not found in the enlightened stage of nirvana. With that being said, my heart still is different now. Paul wrote uh, that the one who started a good work in you continues to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. For the past five years, there's been a bit by bit, piece by piece increase in enjoying the Lord, in experiencing true soul satisfaction in Him alone. God's used many, many variables to bring about this change. One of them is the 131st Psalm. Let's go there. Observe the one to whom the writer addresses. Lord. What is to be shared will come together in a moment. Okay, Our son is 93 million miles away from us. Now, if a ship left today and traveled 5,000 miles per hour, it would take two years, three months, 18 days to reach the sun. When I was a kid learning about the solar system, Pluto was a planet. Now, Pluto, planet or not, is 3.7 billion miles from our sun. Now, if traveling in the same ship, the one previously mentioned, if that ship left the sun and traveled to Pluto, it would take 166 and a half years to reach Pluto. Our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the Milky Way galaxy. Now, our solar system from the sun to Pluto, is this dot right here. Folks, we're looking at one galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is merely one among many galaxies. The best astronomers estimate the existence of over 200 billion observable galaxies. Now in this photo, the Milky Way galaxy is this dot right here. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, is infinitely bigger than all of this. Now when the adverb infinitely is used, that is not hyperbole or exaggeration. It is an apt very appropriate term in this sentence. Jesus is infinitely bigger than all this.
when attempting to compare with this Jesus, who is so infinitely massive, who are we to think ourselves superior to anyone? Footnote, the guy writing this psalm is a king. When the author mentions the condition of his heart, the compass used to display its direction were his eyes. He writes, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. There's a chap from the 1800s who wrote, What the heart desires, the eyes look for. He adds, Where the desires run, the glances usually follow. Boom. Is the Lord lovingly leaning in right now upon hearing that? If so, is he whispering, what are you seeking? If you can answer that, you can articulate your heart's condition. I, I love you as I say that, okay? Where the heart is inclined, efforts are applied. As the eyes are a compass, our muscle is a construction rule, also measuring the condition of our heart. This psalmist says, Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. This is David. He was a kid when the prophet anointed him king. He was 30 years old when he was crowned. There are multiple speculations as to how long he waited for this powerful position after being anointed. Some say, and it's reasonable, it was an 11-year wait. Regardless, it was years, and during these years, he fought battles for his country. He was hunted as an outlaw. He had multiple opportunities to slay the one who was king before him. He waited on God's timing, and he dared not quicken the clock's pace. Before being anointed, he was a shepherd boy. He was content with that. He did not reach out to God. God reached out to him. He was a servant who served the people he ruled. The scriptures share this psalmist sought to seek and save others. This is the heart of one who sat on Israel's throne. Kind of reminds you of someone, doesn't it? The writer is unknowingly coaching us. For in the next verse, he's taking a moment to chill, to be quiet, to breathe. He writes, surely I have behaved and quieted myself. In recent days, your own pastor shared with you the wisdom from a writer earlier quoted to you. It is no easy thing to quiet yourself. Sooner may a man calm the sea or rule the wind or tame a tiger than quiet himself. And yet this is a must. For what comes next, we must truly brace ourselves. As we brace ourselves, we do not do it with white knuckle grip. Rather, we do so with open palm and deep, calm breaths. A kind reminder, the one who starts the task in us is the one who continues the work. Fitting, he is called the Heavenly Father. It offers a parental paradigm. Part of the work done to put the heart into a place where it desires soul satisfaction in God alone is summed in one word, weaning. This is Ava Jo. By family members, she is often called Jojo. Her big sister calls her Joey. Now, I firsthand witness some of this girl's weaning. For a time, there were only two people on the planet permitted to hold her. They are her mother and her mama. 
okay, now I'm not trying to be cute or funny or silly. Call this TMI, but stay with me. There are multiple times when Sharon would call me into the restroom asking me to hold this little creature while Mama briefly did her business. I would remain a mere three feet away and it was insufficient for this child. She would wail loudly, reaching out to her mama, refusing contentment until her mama held her again. Jojo's mother told me, Russ, I have to sit her in my lap while I do my business. She refuses to let me out of her sight. Now, Ava Jo eventually let me in the club. I can hold her now. Not only that, she'll come into the living room, crawl on my lap, slap my face before clamming back down. She melts my heart, for this is how she says, I hope for a moment you capture what is conveyed here. For a time, her cries were once blood-curdling loud. Now, I'm not being a drama king saying this. Blood-curdling loud. And this is for good reason. This is a tremendous picture of a child's pain. Although no big deal to a grown-up, this is very painful for a baby. This is what God wants us to catch. One suffers when weaned. When the heart says, all I need is God and fill in the blank. It is an idolatrous heart. Whatever that fill in the blank is, must be weaned. For this to be done, behave, be quiet, and let it go. Let it go and then what, we ask. Good question. The answer, hope in God. Please do not go away. Please do not turn me off. Please do not dismiss me with a wave of a hand because what I just said sounded too canned. Take a look at verse 3, and after we read it, please stay with me. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Hope here is not the same hope we use when saying things like, I hope James gets out of prison this month. Or, I hope my little girl makes it home safely. I hope our team wins the game. When hope is used in the above sentences, it may very well convey a desire, but it's also mixed with a bit of uncertainty and a, and a bit hint of anxiety. This is not what David conveys when he says, Let Israel hope in the Lord. But rather, he is conveying a certainty, reliance, confidence, an assurance upon God. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. This is the other confidence in which David speaks. Have this quiet confidence in God Almighty. He is sustenance. He is far more than one ever really needs for true soul satisfaction. Now, if hearing this seems to be a bit empty, uh, might not all sound that great. Let's bolt, go see a movie, or let's get something to eat. Perhaps it is from a heart that has yet to be weaned. I just said that with all fear and trembling, and I love you. The weaning, which happens before such a fulfilling connect with the Lord, may very well be painful. For many of us, it is a hard wrestling match. Jacob, he wrestled with God all night, remember? He too got hurt in the process, but when all was said and done, he sure had a different walk. How about that weaning process? 
How about that connect for true soul satisfaction? When do we start? David answers. Start now. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Perhaps one of my favorite lines from the movie Incredibles hails from that tiny fashion designer, Edna Mose. I never look in the past, darling. It distracts from the now. You don't like her? Check out Paul. When it came to all his earthly achievements, which, by the way, amounted to stinky waste, he said he had yet to attain all perfection. Yet, rather, he said he was going to forget all those things which are behind and press forward. He and David lived centuries apart from one another, yet they had the same mind. They had the same heart. Both were weaned. Both found soul satisfaction with God. Let's go and do thou likewise. Russell DeWitt, out. Jeez, that last line was corny.